Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very celebrated author from Singapore, Mr. Felix Cheong. Felix, Thank welcome you. to the show. Thank you. It's my privilege to be here. Thank you. Felix is the author of 22 books across different genres, uh, including poetry, short stories, flash fiction, and children's picture books. He's a lyricist and has collaborated with well-known musicians from around the world. He has been nominated for the prestigious Frank O'Connor Award and the Singapore Literature Prize. And in 2000, he was conferred the Young Artist Award by the National Arts Council. <clears throat> Felix, what an amazing journey you've had. So let's first start talking about uh, your books. Tell me a little bit about your books and what uh, motivated you to start writing. Well, when I began writing, I was really um, trying to assert myself. That Mm. was when I was 14. Mm. And at that point in time, I kind of knew I wanted to be a writer because I wanted my name to be seen in print. Mm. I was an introvert. So the only way for me to assert myself, my personality was to have something published and, you know, to go one up on my classmates, mm. like, you know, you are ignoring me, but I have this. Absolutely. But, I have a book. <laughs> yes, I have a book. Or at least I, back then I had a composition published in a student newspaper. So that was something to, to, to brag about. Mm. But mm. over the years, the motivation for writing has changed. So it became more about expression, about me perhaps wanting to let uh, readers see something else, something to explore something of themselves. So like, for example, my, one of my books that was published in mm-hmm. uh, 2020 mm-hmm. was this book called In the Year of the Virus. Virus. Okay. And it's a series of poems written about the pandemic, mm-hmm. about how the pandemic has affected us mm-hmm. and how we should look at it in a more optimistic light so it's, it's um, poetry with comics okay see. wow very so it's a it's a new genre i'm getting into okay and based on that experience working with an illustrator i decided to collaborate with another illustrator and we came up with this which wow. was published in okay. 2021 last year october yeah and it's a noir detective graphic novel okay and it's also written in poetry form. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. So across um, my 21, 22 years of writing, I've tried to diversify into different genres mm-hmm. because every genre that I encounter is, is a new experience. It's mm-hmm. relearning writing. It's like kicking myself down the stairs okay. in order to learn how to crawl up again. Amazing. And it keeps me humble. So it's tell me, me, Felix, how do you manage so many different genres? Well, I guess I have so many compartments in my head. Okay. So I, I like to um, slot different themes or different ways of writing into different compartments. Mm-hmm. But essentially, it is still writing. So the, the basics of writing don't really change that much. Show, not tell, you know, give details, create interesting characters, believable characters. Um, have a theme, a strong theme that is conveyed to the reader and hooks the reader. So all these are kind of similar across the board. Mm. So it's just a matter of applying the writing skills to different genres, understanding the genre mm-hmm. from inside out. So the one of the first things I usually do before I tackle a new genre is um, get to know the genre. So I would indulge maybe a few weeks of research so immerse mm-hmm. myself in that particular genre, right. read all uh, various books in that genre, um, look at what other writers have said about the writing this genre. Mm-hmm. So that was how I got into writing libretto as well. Wonderful. So, you know, there's a question, Felix, that is often asked from writers, and I'm going to ask this from you also. Yes. What makes a good writer and what makes a good story? So uh, there are two questions there. So what makes a good writer? I would say probably three things. So talent, skill, insight. Mm -hmm. So talent is something you're born with, maybe your facility to tell a story or your writing ability. 
But if you don't hone this, it will go to waste. Mm. It will just lie fallow in, in a wasteland. So you need skill. Mm. You need that discipline, the motivation to keep crafting it, honing it mm. in order to um, perfect it. And then, of course, you need insight. Insight is not something that um, a master class can teach you. Mm. It's your own life experience, your mm. own personality, what you bring to it. Mm your own voice, your style, the way you look at the world, perhaps in, uh, influenced by your upbringing, your religion, your education, the books you've read. Mm. So all these things come together to make the writer that is you. Wonderful. So what makes a good story? I would say in a very simple form, of course, it's beginning, middle and end. Mm -hmm. But of course, not necessarily in that order. Mm. So sometimes a good story can begin at the end, like this uh, graphic novel. Mm. It actually begins with the end. Okay. And then it kind of loops itself back to the beginning to tell the story. So it's a way of finding a hook and how to get the reader to, to go on the journey of the mm. storytelling with you, mm. the narrative. What else makes a good book? Um, I suppose it's the immersion of your reader in that particular story universe that you have created. Mm. Very interesting. And you mentioned that uh, writing is a skill that you're born with. Um, I'd love to get your perspective. Can writers be trained? Yes, of course. I mean, that's why we have, you know, uh, de degrees in creative writing, right. a master's program in creative writing, and even a PhD. So you can train um, yourself to be a better writer. Mm. But as I said, the third component is actually more important, the mm. insight. So I've read writers, for example, who are technically quite skilled, but they really have nothing to say. Mm. So if you dissect it, you know, create, um, do an autopsy on the writing, mm. it is quite shallow and nothing really much to say. Mm. So you must have something you want to get off your chest. I'm not saying that you need to be pushing an agenda. Correct. No, not, not, not propaganda writing, but it's something that you can offer to the world, a way of looking at the world, Absolutely. perspective. I agree with you. In fact, I've often said this when I speak at conferences, that I have a lot of respect for authors because they're willing to put their thoughts out in the public domain and be willing to get criticized for it. Yep. Yep. You know, so I think that to me shows a lot of character whenever a person writes a book. So I have a lot of respect for authors. Yes. But so it's putting yourself on the line. Correct. But also developing that thick skin to be able to withstand <laughs> the criticism. Yes. Um, I think it takes a bit of a while, uh, uh, a while for you to get used to it. Mm. But sometimes I read um, reviews of my books on Goodreads and other platforms. And not all of it is flattering. Correct. But I, I just take it with a pinch of salt. Absolutely. You've you got to accept everything that comes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, tell me, what is your schedule uh, when you write? Do you have a fixed schedule that for three hours in the morning and four hours in the evening, I'm going to write? Or is it just when you feel like writing? Well, um, when I'm embarking on a project, I try to be a bit more disciplined. Although because of my teaching schedule, you know, I, I'm a freelance lecturer. So I try to write in between my lessons. Mm. So um, I always try to find pockets of time when I don't really have uh, anything at the back of my mind. Like, you know, I have to do my marking by end of this week. Mm. Otherwise, the students will scream at me for not getting the assignments back. Correct. So if I don't have the, those kind of uh, thoughts, then I'm, my mind is a lot more free to write, to mm. create. Mm. I, I can write anywhere. I, I think most people tend to think that writers need a glass of wine, mm. you know, by the pool or by the seaside. Not necessarily. Absolutely. I've yeah, I've done writing on the bus. Mm. Like I will use my mobile phone yeah. and I will just yeah. write onto a memo pad. I've written on the MRT, the train. Mm. I've written at cafes. Uh, even though it's really noisy, but actually that white noise helps me to internalize the, the writing process. Mm. Very interesting. So, mm, so each, right. each uh, writer has to find his or her own space Correct. that is conducive for them to create. Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, I have the same kind of a thing when I write. When I'm in the frame of writing, I wake up at two in the morning. 
Mm-hmm. And I go and sit in my study and I, by the time my wife wakes up, I would have written maybe 3000 words, mm-hmm. but there are you know, days when I don't write at all. So yes, it is. Um, some people call it a muse, mm-hmm. although I don't really subscribe to the idea of, you know, some divine muse visiting you. It's, I think, um, something innate in you that propels you to write. Correct. Correct. You agree? Well well, sir, I completely agree. Yeah. So also tell me, Felix, with such a prolific uh, writing uh, schedule of 22 books, and I'm sure you're working on more, do you all ever face writer's block? Well, I think writer's block is this fantastical idea that some people have created to excuse themselves for not <laughs> writing. Yes. Um, in fact, some of my writer friends and I joke, if we ever have money to pull together to create a condominium just for writers. Mm. One of the blocks would be named Writer's Block. <laughs> writer's Block of Flats, yes. so to speak. Well, I think most of the time, people encounter Writer's Block for one of several reasons. Mm. So number one, you don't really have anything to say. Okay. That's why not, nothing comes up. Mm. Number two, you have something to say, but you don't know how to say it. Correct. So the means doesn't quite um, facilitate the what you want to say. Mm-hmm. And I think the third is really no time to really sit down and, and discipline yourself to do it. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, I as a reporter, I interviewed this American crime fiction writer once. Mm-hmm. His name is uh, Jake Neham. Mm-hmm. He said to be a good writer, you need an iron butt. Okay. I'm quoting him. You really need to sit yourself down like, like you and really pull out the words. 3,000 words, 4,000 words every day, you know, in order to finish your novel. Correct. Correct. Well said. Well said. So my next question to you is on the publication of a book. Um, you know, with, with you, I'm sure publishers are running after you to say, you know, can we take your next book? Oh, no, no, no. It's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then, then it, all the more reason for me to ask you this question. That how does a first-time author get published? Well, there are various ways. I suppose first you have to start getting published, um, say, at, in um, e-journals, mm. literary journals. There are quite a lot of uh, journals around. Then second way is perhaps take part in competitions. Mm. Then you build a, a resume of writing. Maybe after you've won a couple of awards, publishers will sit up and take notice. The third is, of course, um, very popular now with young people, Instagram writing. Yeah. So you publish on Instagram and you get, say, 200,000 followers or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then the publishers will sit up and notice, ah, okay, this young writer has 200,000 followers. Maybe those followers may end up buying the books. Mm. So do you have a manuscript to offer? Okay. So it's, um, it's a process of um, getting yourself into the scene, understanding um, the ins and outs of the scene. Mm. Networking is important as well. Mm. So I always advise um, beginning writers to attend literary festivals. I think that's one way to hook yeah. up Mm. get to know the scene, connect with publishers, mm. get advice from uh, veteran writers mm-hmm. so you know better how to navigate the scene. Correct. So every scene is different. Correct. Correct. Yeah? So it's different in yeah. India, different in Absolutely. Singapore. Absolutely right. And uh, from your perspective, is self-publishing an option for uh, new writers? I think it is, although I wouldn't recommend it um, in the long term as you develop as a writer. Mm. So the f- first book that you usually self-publish tends to be indulgent mm. because you don't really have an editor to tell you, mm, this is too flabby, right. you should cut this out. You know, the layout and the design is often amateurish. Mm. So you do need a third pair of eyes to take a look at it and tell you, mm, this, part, this part doesn't work, cut it out. Mm-hmm. Move chapter three to one, Correct. And then move it around, rewrite parts. So self-publishing is a viable option, although not for the long term. I agree with you. And of course, there is that other problem of self-publishing that you can't get your book onto store shelves. Yeah. yeah. 
which is a very so, critical yes. part of every author's uh, dream. Yes. So you need to do the legwork of knocking on the doors of the um, bookshop, you know, maybe going down on your knees yeah. <laughs> to yeah. beg them to take, you know, five copies of your book. And it's also um, getting the word out there to the press mm. because the infrastructure for most publishers is already established with um, the mainstream press. So they have that, that relationship when they have a book out, they will send a press release, you know, get the journalists uh, interested in reviewing your book, yeah. but you don't have that um, access. So you have to create your own network of trying to get access to the mainstream press to, yeah. re to review your book, well which is hard. So that takes a lot of legwork for a beginning writer. Interesting. So one more question about uh, your journey as an author before I move to your journey as a lyricist. Uh, the sense I get when I speak to a lot of authors around the world is that the younger people uh, are not reading as much as the publishers or authors would like them to. Mm -hmm. um, and someone else, of course, told me that uh, the pricing of a book should be equal to the price of a movie ticket. You know, uh, these are norms that are being formulated by different people. I'd love to get your thoughts. Well, as to the pricing wise, well, um, I suppose you can't really compare it's like comparing apples and mm. oranges. I mean, the price of a movie ticket for a Hollywood film, the Hollywood film is backed by, you know, millions of dollars of American cash. Yeah. So we, there's no way in heaven or hell we can compete with that. So the publishers do have to, you know, um, make ends meet and the profit margin is really thin. And particularly for, say, children's books like these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is my children's book, which was published yeah. last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's all full colored and every page is in color. So it takes a lot more to print that compared to a novel. Mm -hmm. And still, we have to keep the prices manageable okay. and more affordable. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So um, as to your earlier question about... Um, Whether young, young people, people are reading. reading. Yeah. I think that's a common misconception that because of the obsession with the smartphone that they're not reading. They are reading, mm -hmm. although they may not be reading the classics that we were brought up on. Mm -hmm. They may not read Crime and Punishment or Middle March because it's way really too thick Correct. and their attention span is really mm -hmm. short. Mm -hmm. But they are reading. I mean, they are reading more contemporary novels that mm -hmm. appeal to them, that mm -hmm. connect to them. At an emotional Very level. Very interesting. So let's now move to your, uh, you know, uh, avatar of, as a lyricist. Mm. Uh, tell me about your compositions, One at a Time and Panic Love. Um, well, I didn't really write the music per se. I wrote the lyrics. Mm. And um, for uh, at one time, it was um, for a competition, uh, an opera. It was an open call for an opera. Um, competition. Mm -hmm. So I partnered with a composer, jo Jonathan Sheen, and we met up for coffee and we discussed the idea for uh, an opera. So I came up with the story of how a young boy who is being, um, who watches his mother being abused by the father, okay. then internalizes that kind of abuse, mm -hmm. that kind of bullying mm -hmm. in school. And he takes it out on his best friend, wow. who is a who is a closet homosexual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and then the best friend later commits suicide. So it's quite a dark tale. Mm -hmm. And we came in third for that particular competition, mm -hmm. won the third prize. But at the at this point in time, there are no plans to stage it. Okay. Then the second libretto, um, Panic Love was a collaboration with another composer, mm -hmm. Chen Zhang Yi, uh, who's quite a well-known Singapore composer. Mm -hmm. We thought of um, setting the story at, during the time of the pandemic, or at least in Singapore, uh, during the lockdown, which we call Circuit Breaker, mm -hmm. for one of a better uh, euphemism. Yeah. So the story revolves around one of these social distancing ambassadors mm. those who go around telling people keep one meter apart, put on your mask or, or else I'll find you. So 
she is very finicky. This character is very finicky about making people follow the rules. Mm -hmm. But um, she herself is caught in a bind because she cannot visit the nursing home where her mother is dying. Because at that point in time in Singapore, uh, nursing homes were also not uh, permitted to receive visitors to stop the spread of uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So we, we played with that uh, irony of someone who is finicky about mm. imposing rules. Mm. Then she's caught up by the very same rules that she um, implements. So it was uh, recorded eventually. We got a grant from the National Arts Council mm. to do it as a music video. Wow. So that was uh, recorded and that, that was a fun experience. Fascinating, fascinating. So I've got time for one more question, uh, Felix, and I'm going to ask you this question for the many, many young people who will listen to our conversation. In a life so well lived with so much success as an author and as a lyricist, please share with me three life lessons that you want our viewers and listeners to take back from our conversation. Three life lessons. Mm. Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> it makes it sound like I've reached the end of my life. <laughs> I'm looking back on my deathbed. Um, I suppose one is um, to be a bit more observant about life. Okay. I think most of us tend to go through life just, you know, lock into this, yeah. <laughs> not really opening our eyes and ears to things yeah. happening around us. So a good writer is always interested in people okay. and happenings. Yeah, that, so that's, I think, one way. And have a journal with you to take notes uh -huh. that that helps. Yeah. Or uh, remember a scene so that later you can reproduce it in your head. Yeah. Or remember snatches of conversation so that later you can reproduce that on your keyboard. Mm. And the second thing, of course, is to read widely. Okay. Doesn't matter what you read. So yeah. from newspapers to journals to magazines to books to plays to um, movie scripts, whatever it is, read, read, read. Because the more you read, the more you're assimilating and learning from other writers. That's, what, mm, that's how that's you can grow as a writer. Amazing. And not be that's so insular. Amazing. And I guess the third um, life lesson is really to have the courage of your conviction yeah. to put your word out there, uh, your, your words out there. Well said. I agree. I agree. So, you know, to observe life, to write a journal, to read, and to have courage of conviction. I mean, what <laughs> great lessons you have given to all of us, Felix. And on that note, uh, thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you so Thank much you. for having me. Cheers. Yes, cheers, cheers, cheers. And good luck and all the very best. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.